It's also an era of new and multiplying intervention actors. Um, we've got the traditional actors, the MSF uh, actors. Um, we have a combination of um, NGOs coupled with national support. Um, this is uh, a picture of, from Haiti, uh, uh, Finnair donating uh, free transportation to Finnish goods being uh, shipped to Haiti. So, and this is not a criticism, it's just a description. Um, these are um, um, prostheses. Uh, Finland makes great prostheses and uh, um, that's one of the first things that are required in these situations. And we had exactly the same image in, uh, in Bosnia um, where Finland provided not only the, uh, the prostheses but also the teams that would come in uniform to deliver them uh, using Finnish military transport planes to do that. So there is, a, there is a, a relationship there that is also part of that economic political uh, relationship. Um, and then we've got something else that happened, started I think in the Bosnian operation. Um, most of you are probably too young to remember but there was a young girl in Sarajevo who was uh, caught in a very serious bomb blast and um, uh, we felt that she could not be treated successfully in Sarajevo. Um, we did not know how to get her out of Sarajevo and um, we happened to meet uh, Christian Amunpur and had a discussion with her and that night um, the case of this girl was flashed around the world and the BBC took it up and so then the British military said they would fly her out to the UK. Um, she, she, didn't, she went through I think 16 operations and she, she didn't survive which raises the whole question of medical evacuation of difficult victims but what it did was to open the door to medical evacuation. Now medical evacuation is not simple and there is only one group that does it well and that's the military. So in Bosnia we saw by 1993 a massive medical evacuation program using military flights. These are Canadian flights and what would happen was that we would take them down on military transports to split uh, by helicopter and then a fixed wing aircraft would pick them up in split and take them to Italy uh, or elsewhere uh, for care. Um, and then we have the other main actor that is emerging and that is the peacekeeping operations. And if you look at the peacekeeping operation today um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you will see how this has evolved. Peacekeepers in Bosnia were literally, purely and simply, military guards who protected us. Um, in DRC today, that same operation has become a quasi-government. It has become a shadow government. It provides technical expertise to the government, it brings in technical experts, um, it has a police force, uh, it has engineers, um, and it has a huge program, for example, on sexual gender-based violence, um, and on HIV and tuberculosis. So it, Monuk has become now something much larger than we've ever seen before, to the point that now we're talking about an integrated approach, possibly under the auspices of peacekeeping operations, which changes the whole panorama of humanitarian assistance. I'm, I'm not passing a judgment on this, um, but it, the panorama is changing and changing uh, very quickly. And finally, as we've seen in the Haitian uh, situation, the military itself is now playing a much clearer, well-defined humanitarian assistance program. They're there not only to protect and to provide security, they're actually delivering goods. So, the question is, has coordination kept pace with all these, these developments? Um, and I would say that the conclusion is that coordination has not. 
coordination continues to be resisted, uh, coordination continues to be distrusted um, and undervalued by all the actors. And when I say the actors, under that humanitarian traditional group that I put up in the top left-hand corner, which was a picture of an MSF nurse, we've had a huge proliferation. So when I got to Bosnia in 1990, end of, beginning of 1993, there were 10 non-governmental relief organizations. When I left, we had registered 387. Uh, and that is indicative of what is happening everywhere, a proliferation of organizations. Some highly qualified, very structured, very well prepared, and others less so. Um, one of my vivid memories of Bosnia was um, in the middle of the night being called up by the uh, British battalion to go out with them because a... Um, an NGO humanitarian truck had been caught between the battle lines. Winter, foggy, bit snowy, a um, lot of shooting, and here we go and we try to find what is happening. And it turns out to be a small Bedford truck driven by two middle-aged people from the UK full of teddy bears. Um, now, it's not to belittle teddy bears, children need, from a psychological point of view, toys. It's not to belittle the concern and the commitment of these two people, but it puts into question the lack of professionalism that often characterizes a lot of the humanitarian assistance programs. And over the last five years, you have probably seen a growth in programs of training people for humanitarian assistance. And that is because we have realized that people were going into the field who should not, never have gone into the field. They should not have gone into the field because they didn't understand what was required. They didn't understand what they were supposed to do. They didn't have the type of technical training that was required. And I think there is a message here that we all have to take home. We have to be far more humble when we think about humanitarian assistance and what it is that we purport to be able to do in response to crises.